WLRN Video presents Hello and welcome back to another WLRN Extended Interview. My name is April Nell, WLRN Canadian member. This interview, Aurora Linnea sits down with the world-renowned author and former university professor, Sheila Jeffries, to discuss her new book, Penile Imperialism, The Male Sex Right and Women's Subordination. Sheila discusses why there is always a sexual component to men's subordination over women in both the private and public sphere. That this sexual subordination should be seen as an organizing principle of male domination. She discusses how fetishes have become normalized in our culture and how they were politically created out of the power difference of male domination and that ultimately male sexuality is constructed by their position of power. Listen now. So to start off with, for someone who hasn't read the book, uh, could you introduce the concept of the male sex right? Um, I think it's such a a really strong sort of unified theory of something that we haven't had a good word for. So I would just love for you to sort of introduce that concept for us. Yes, well, the, the, the subtitle of the book is The Male Sex Right and Women's Subordination. And by the male sex right, I mean um, what um, some other feminist theorists have also used the concept mean, which is that men have as a fundamental right and organizing principle of male domination, that they should have access to the bodies of unwilling women and children, and that they should have that as a right, and that this right is protected by the state and the legal system in things such as, of course, um, prostitution and pornography, and the right of men to use their wives um, in, and partners in marriage, uh, the, uh, and so on, and many other things that I don't cover in the book, but I've covered in previous books, such as arranged and forced marriage and child marriage. There are many, many, many situations. So it is an absolutely fundamental principle that men should have access to the bodies of women and children, and that this should be recognized and protected by the states and governments of male domination. Why do you think that the male sex right is such an essential element um, and foundational element of patriarchy? Sort of what is what is its um, uh, social function uh, in the maintenance of male power? Or is it more just that really the sort of unbridled pursuit of sexual gratification drives men in and of itself? I do argue in the book that there are several ways in which the expression of the male sex right is fundamental to maintaining male domination and the subordination of women. Uh, and one of these ways, of course, is the uh, exercise of male sexuality on women in partnerships with men. Uh, and I, I point out, as I have pointed out in previous books, that the sexologists, the scientists of sex, understand uh, that if a woman is penetrated and especially if she um, has a sexual reaction to that penetration, she is subordinated and she is then fixated on the man and she uh, and she she will subordinate herself to his will. There's some stuff that I've used in the book to explain this. For instance, in the 1960s, there was um, a, a wonderful book on the power of sexual surrender by a, a female sexologist, in fact, and she explained how when treating women, because there were women have throughout the 20th century and still today resisted the male sex right for the sake of their own dignity, their independence, their control over their own bodies. They have resisted it because they simply didn't want to do these practices. But this sexologist from the 60s in the power of sexual surrender, explains that there are two cases that she was in, involved in of women who didn't want to do uh, penile penetration of their vaginas, um, and or at least did not have orgasms. In it. They didn't have orgasms, so they probably had no choice but to accept it, the practice, but they didn't have orgasms. So she says in one case, uh, the woman was taught how to have an orgasm, and then instead of being cross with her husband for leaving his underpants all over the bathroom floor. 
she was perfectly happy to pick them up. In another case, the husband wanted to move across the states from one side to the other, and the wife did not wish to go with him, so she didn't want him to move. She was uh, treated uh, for being able to have an orgasm, and then she happily moved with him. So it was very, very clear, and there are many, 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 many other examples I could give from all the sexological writings, which are very clear, that making sure that women uh, are penetrated and that they have some kind of pleasure in that penetration subordinates them to their husband will. It makes them willing handmaidens. So that's one way, and, and there are many ways in which the male sex right and its exercise uh, keeps male supremacy going and keeps men in power. But another way in the book, I've got a, a chapter on male sexuality as social control in the public sphere. And in the public sphere, of course, the uh, exercise of male sexuality and the male sex right through sexual harassment up to the sex murder of women is a very serious constraint on all of those things which normally we would see as ordinary human rights. You know, in human rights charters, it says what you know, human rights are supposed to be. Women don't have access to any of those if the, if the male sex right is able to interrupt them. For instance, if we think about the right to entertainment and pleasure in public places and so on, the male sex right means that men sexually harass, stalk, and potentially can murder women at public venues of entertainment. So that's why women have to be afraid in those public spaces in a way that men never would have to be. So it, it limits their movements. If we're thinking about women simply being in public space, walking to or from work or from places of entertainment or to visit friends, not only are they likely to be sexually harassed and have to be constantly careful where they're going, what they're ha happening in their journeys, constantly afraid and probably limiting their journeys because many women do limit their journeys, um, but also they may simply be murdered. And I give um, examples in the book of many murders that have taken place in Britain and in Australia for women who were simply going along the footpath or standing at a bus stop and so on and so on. So this is, as I explain in the book, it can be seen as a reign of uh, terror and a reign of very violent and frightening penile imperialism. There are not really other groups of people who have to be afraid that when they're standing by the bus stop, a man may abduct them, murder them, and rape them. I mean, this doesn't really happen to any other groups of people. And yet constantly, as I explain in the book, and I'm sure you know, all of these instances are explained individually. It used to be said that women just were in the wrong place at the wrong time, they should limit their behavior. Um, or uh, it's, it's explained in terms of the individual men, you know, the particular man, um, had a problem, uh, but it was only an individual man, and we don't need to think about that. But the fact is, what I try to do in the book is put it together and say, we do need to think about this, because it's a political practice which has huge effects upon women's lives. It very seriously impedes and restricts the lives of women and children. Yes. Um, I suppose a, a follow-up question for that would be, with the... Um, the terrorism in the public sphere, why is it so important um, that it is sexual? Because one can imagine that men as a group could make women's movement through the, the social world quite horrible um, mm -hmm. just through harassment in general, but that it has a sexual element um, seems obviously very um, specific to male power in some way. Uh, and I just, I wonder what you would attribute it's being specifically sexual. Um, Cause theoretically men could um, <laughs> torture us in the public space just by harassing and kidnapping us, right? Without it having that, um, without the threat of, of bodily violation through, through sexual attacks. So I, I wonder about the specific political force of the sexual there, I guess. But one would have to ask, why would they do that? Because of course, the subordination of women is specifically through our bodies and very specifically sexual. And that gives men pleasure and is very uh, particular in the way that it oppresses women 
keeps women in place and, and so on. So what would be in it for men to simply do these things to women if women, if they accepted women were other equal human beings um, and were not sexual objects, well, what would be in it for them? Uh, so yes, women's oppression is specifically sexual. It's carried out sexually. It's seen as sexual. I mean, I, I have written other books and I'm, I'm sure you're aware on the way in which uh, women are sexualized for men's excitement in uh, public space and all public places through, for instance, beauty practices. And you know, in, in this country, and it may be true in, in America as well, um, news presenters, for instance, wear extraordinary pornographic shoes. I mean, incredibly high heels, uh, stilettos, shoes that really we haven't seen for 40 years. Back in, the, you know, maybe a long time ago, women were forced into those kinds of shoes if, if you were Marilyn Monroe or something. But now we have these very intelligent, wonderful women news presenters portrayed in this way, in pain, basically it's in pain. The pain's exciting because of in male domination, women's pain is exciting to men. That's you know, crucial to understand. So men are all getting off on the pain of seeing the women portrayed in this way. And of course the cameras linger on the feet, but there are many, many, many other aspects of the way in which women are forced to behave sexually and to array themselves sexually through, for instance, long hair, which satisfies um, sexual fetishism, through makeup, through the exposure of different parts of the body, um, and so on. All of this makes men very excited. So I explain in Beauty and Misogyny, my book on these practices, originally from 2005, um, a sex psychologist uh, wrote a book about women's high heel shoes and what it did for men, and he was very excited about it. And he said that men who were walking behind a woman in high-heeled shoes would just hear the noise first because it sounds like the, the uh, a horse's hooves clopping along the pavement. And as soon as he heard that, he would go into the first stages of arousal, simply that. So I explain in that book that the, the world in which women are portrayed in this way and pleasing men by uh, their subordination and their service, their unpaid sexual service in the streets, on the buses and so on, um, that, that, it, that it makes the world into a sort of unpaid outdoor brothel for men where they're constantly able to get this satisfaction from the subordination of women in public life. So I guess that's another aspect of this whole problem. But of course, this book was about something slightly different. I have done different books on prostitution, beauty practices, and so on and so on. So yes, women, the women's sexual exploitation is absolutely fundamental, women's sexual use to their subordination, to what they're for, and to the satisfaction of it. So some people um, might criticize the focus on um, these more sort of anomalous sexual practices um, like nappy fetishism or adult babyism as being uh, freak behaviors and not representative of uh, male sexuality in any kind of general way. What would be your response to that? Um, and what what insights would you say that these more sort of seemingly aberrant practices uh, offer? Yes, the, the second half of my book looks at the way in which what I call the sexual perversions, they're not now more normally called paraphilias and so on, because the one of the things that has uh, happened to all of these so-called perversions is that they've been normalized. I explained in the book that since the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s and the development of the pornography industry, many uh, forms of practice that which once would have been unusual and seen as aberrant for men, which, but which did exist because the sexologists write about them in the 19th century. These practices have been normalized. They, the, some of them are subject to campaigns of normalization, like pedophilia, like sadomasochism, like transvestism, all of which I write about in the book. So there have been actual campaigns since the 70s to normalize the practice um, through the, the, these campaigns have been carried out by, for instance, in the, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatrist Association, 
they the campaigners seek to destigmatize their practice so that it's seen the practices are seen as healthy and normal and not matters of mental health so that's the first thing to make them publicly okay they have to destigmatize them then they seek to remove the law and make these practices all uh, completely acceptable legally in such as in cases where there is a law against it like in pedophilia there usually is there are campaigns to remove the age of consent or reduce the age of consent and so on. Uh, in transvestism, uh, of course, all of these things happen as well, a campaign to, uh, to change the medical definition, to get law changed so that the men can engage in the practices and get erections in public spaces and in spaces where women are, and so on and so on. So though these practices might have been seen as unusual in the late 19th century, what we've got in the late 20th century is that many of these practices have become absolutely normalized. For instance, if we think about sadomasochism, and I've got a chapter in the book on sadomasochism called The Rise of Kink, uh, I think it was, it, it was unknown when I was a young woman that strangulation, which of course is, is at risk of death, would be an ordinary sexual practice. Now, as I explain in the book, in women's health magazines and so on, uh, it's described as something that will make sex a little more exciting. And there's instructions about how to make sure you get strangled safely because it's the women getting strangled and the men doing the strangling, of course. Now, that's something that I don't think we could have imagined in the 1970s when I became involved in feminism. And, and at that time, one of the seven demands of the women's liberation movement in the UK was a self-defined sexuality for women. I don't think that we intended strangulation. Okay? So things that it would have been impossible to imagine and might have been seen as aberrant at one time and have now been very much normalized to the point at which they're discussed in ordinary magazines and, uh, and of course deaths are happening and men are using the, um, the, uh, the self-defense that a woman consented to uh, strangulation because women now seem to consent to all kinds of serious practices against them as a result of the normalization of sadomasochism that has taken place through pornography in particular and through campaigning organizations. So aberrant is not what these activities are now. If we think about transvestism, for instance, Presently, not only have we got men who cross-dress for sexual excitement, uh, demanding access to all women's places, demanding to be accepted as women and so on, just about any program that you see on the television has men in drag. You will always have a drag queen. I don't think I watch an evening of television without seeing a drag queen somewhere. Now, that wasn't the case in the 60s and 70s. And of course, in the book, I explain that's an incredibly insulting practice to women and needs to be seen as the same as blackface, but is not treated in the same way because women are not seen as significant and therefore it can't be recognized as an insult. So drag, the imitation of women to mock and make fun of women and create uh, frightening and, and harmful stereotypes of women, that's now completely accepted, as is the institution of transvestites everywhere. So that's what I would say to your potential friend who might say, well, surely these are aberrant uh, forms of behavior. They might once have been still dangerous to women, but maybe aberrant. That's not the case now. And you mentioned nappy fetishism. And of course, in the book, I explain that this practice is, this practice is now, right now, in the process of transformation. You know, 10 years ago, the sexologists weren't writing about it. There weren't any cases in the literature. It was unusual. But now we've got all the usual websites on the internet that are promoting it and supporting men who are into it. We've got specialized shops, huge numbers of specialized retailers, and of course, nappy fetishism and age regression and adult baby syndrome or whatever, all these different names for it, um, is a form of transvestism. It's men pretending to be female babies, pretending to be little girls, and so the clothing is pink and the nappies are have pink edges and the, and the bibs are pink and so on and so on. But it is getting bigger and bigger and we're getting to the point where it's becoming a serious problem. What I'm pointing out in the book is the way that these forms of behavior are actually enormously harmful to women and girls, really, really harmful. Um, and so in, in terms of nappy fetishism, 
we've got a situation where, I mean, there was a case recently in Australia where um, the man liked to wear and show his nappies. They'd be visible above his trouser line because that was exciting to him. And so these men are starting to come out in public. You know, they'll be in the office, they'll be in the workplace and so on and so on. Um, so the woman uh, had cust uh, custody of her children and she didn't want the children to be with the man if he was showing the nappy. Right? And the judge, in fact, in the court case, the family court, fortunately decided, I don't think this will last, but he fortunately decided um, that the children should not have to visit a man who was likely to be wearing a nappy. Um, in front of them, right? Now, this is important. it's an important principle. I do explain in the book that one of the forms of normalization that's being demanded for sadomasochism and other practices is that men should be able to do all of these things in their home. They should be able to do all of them in front of children, and that should not be seen as a problem at all. And there's been a court case, uh, there's been a case in this country, in the UK, where a man demanded nappies in prison you know, in the same way that men can demand makeup in prison, a man demanded to be, to be supplied with nappies in prison. Um, I think in that case, he wasn't allowed to do it, but he soon will be because all of these practices are being normalized as men's rights, in fact. So we're in the, the moment, at this moment, that a practice which is harmful to women and children, because you should see what the women are expected to do in terms of nappy fetishism, you know, putting up with it in the home, changing the men's nappies, and so on and so on. Um, these this is a practice which is in the process, and that's why it's so interesting, of normalization at this moment. We've gone a very, 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 very long way with transvestism and sadomasochism, but nappy fetishism is not quite there, uh, as is true of many of the other practices that, uh, that are part of kink, all the different sexual perversions that I mention in the book. Many of them have not got as far as others. I mean, paedophilia is still having a bit of trouble, um, but it has come a long way so that they're accepted as minor attracted persons. They've changed the vocabulary. They've actually persuaded sexologists and criminologists that there are different categories of paedophiles. There's uh, nice paedophiles who wouldn't dream of touching children who are called the non-contact paedophiles. They may want sex dolls and they may fantasize about children, but of course they would never touch them. And they should be seen as having a sexual orientation and you mustn't stigmatize them. You mustn't say anything bad about them because if you do, it will upset them and they will abuse children. That's the most extraordinary thing. This incredible catch 22 that we're in right now, according to the writings of unfortunately women criminologists um, that actually you have to be careful not to say anything nasty about a man in the, your street who is a non-contact pedophile because that will make him offend against children. So you would be responsible. You would be, you have to love the paedophiles in your street, the paedophile next door, tell them how much you love them to try and make sure that they won't act out the fantasies and the things they're now doing to the child sex dolls in their bedrooms. Yeah. Um, the, the idea that we need to support our local pedophiles in order to prevent them from offending uh, is is really quite astonishing. Um, and, that, and what you're just talking about segues well into my next question, which is that um, I sense amongst progressive types um, that there's a real <clears throat> reluctance to label any sexual practice um, as deviant or to pathologize it in any way um, because of the way that um, homosexuality has been similarly pathologized uh, and people are very leery about, about going down that road and are, are afraid of recreating uh, the mistakes of history in that way. But um, as obviously that kind of normalization and destigmatization has enabled the promotion of behaviors and practices that are really obviously harmful. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can work to differentiate those things which are um, injurious male uh, sexual practices that deserve to be stigmatized um, and differentiate those from practices that are pathologized or have been pathologized uh, in the enforcement of patriarchal heterosexuality? 
Yes. I mean, the, in, the interesting thing, of course, is that the, um, the sexual liberationists who decided that these pract- the, the, the paraphilias, the perversion, should all be normalized in the 1970s uh, and thereafter, used the model of homosexuality. They said because homosexuality was once criminalized, and as a result of campaigns, um, the law was changed and the stigmatizing of it in um, this DSM as a mental illness was also changed and defeated by gay liberationists. Because that was the case, any form of sexual practice that men chose to engage in, and of course, homosexuality is practiced by both women and men, but the perversions, it's almost entirely male. So we are talking about something a little bit different. Um, They said that all of these uh, perversion practices should also be uh, accepted. Now, uh, there are many difficulties uh, with this uh, analysis, but it is, it's worked. It has worked. I think for decades, people have been so sort of brainwashed by all of this. They thought we've got to have gay marriage. We've got to have gay everything. We've got to have a gay everything. And therefore, we'll have all sexual practices that men want to do to anybody. But the difference, of course, is that though gay men, for instance, may engage in fetishistic behavior, and some of them do, it is not in itself fetishistic. There's no parts of a person that's chosen in t- instead of that person. And they're not practices which are specifically about degradation or the acting out of pra- um, uh, differences of power. They are ordinary adult relationships of love and sexual attraction between adult humans. So homosexuality, like heterosexuality, there's nothing specifically fetishistic about it, and it doesn't have to be about the eroticizing of power difference. It's not politically created out of the power difference of male domination, which I argue all of these practices of men are because male sexuality is constructed by their position of power. And it's very unfortunate that there's been a confusion, a deliberate confusion, particularly by transvestites, as you know, who have said, who have tried to, to have infiltrated all of the different um, gay organizations and now very often run them and totally dominate their agenda, trying to pretend that their sexual fetish of having the identity of a woman is somehow like a sexual orientation, which is loving other adult human beings of the same sex. So yes, it's extremely unfortunate and what it's led to is, is considerable damage because I think in the public mind and maybe in the legal mind and in other ways, Uh, there's going to be and is beginning to be damage to the status of lesbians and gays from the fact that men with these perversions are so constantly associated with them. I think it's a very serious problem. And more and more you see gay men, this didn't used to happen, they just ignored it or thought it was nothing to do with them. But more recently, you see more and more gay men coming out to say that transvestism is a serious problem because they are realizing the serious damage to their own position. For instance, transvestism wipes out homosexuality. (laughs) After decades of lesbians and gay men trying to assert gay rights, transvestism says that, for instance, a woman has no right to be a lesbian and choose women. She's got to choose men if they say they have a female penis or if they say they're a woman or she's transphobic, engaging in hate and so on and so on. So you know, transvestism in the end comes back to bite homosexuals in the sense that it actually wipes out the concept of homosexuality. So the two things are tremendously, tremendously different. And it's very important that everybody gets educated on that difference and is able to defend and speak about that difference, because obviously we don't want harm to lesbian and gay rights from the behavior and the campaigns of transvestites and all of these other Uh, men with harmful behaviors as well. You are listening to WLRN. (laughs) Relatedly as well, um, in, in penile imperialism and in gender hurts as well, you obviously make a great case for the the underlying sexual basis of of transvestism and men's um, fetishistic cosmetic surgery practices. Um, so it's clear that those that that has a sexual component. It's not as clear uh, that there is a sexual component to the um, 
increasing participation of women and girls in transgenderism. So uh, their sort of growing desire to switch sexes. Um, what do you think the role is uh, of women and girls and also children uh, who, all, who wouldn't have a sexual motivation um, in their transgenderism? Um, what is their role in the campaign for transvestism that is at base about male sexual gratification? Um, yeah. Well, I, I explain in the book that the perversions are male. The only what perversion in the book that women are involved in in terms of receiving sexual satisfaction is sadomasochism. And I explain in the chapter on sadomasochism that the uh, women are generally only engaged as masochists, the dominants are always men, that the research shows that women are pretty much forced into it by men because the women don't usually particularly want to take part. If the men want to find dominance, then they have to uh, resort to prostituted women to act as dominants. So the power difference between men and women is still very, very clear. So sadomasochism simply acts out the ordinary but very brutalized form of the ordinary power difference men top and women bottom of male domination. But that is the only um, practice in the book in which women really take part at all. Uh, the others are perversions. And I explain that the perversions come out of male sexuality. They're about eroticizing dominance and submission, and they're constructed by the power relations of male domination. So in terms of uh, pedophilia, for instance, we do not find women who are very sexually excited by um, five-year-old boys. We actually don't find women who are sexually excited by pretending to be little boys in nappies either. I mean, this actually doesn't exist. In my paedophilia chapter, I explain that if women are actually uh, accused of offences related to paedophilia, it's usually because they have been under the domination of and have helped men who wanted to engage in that such that behaviour. So when it comes to transvestism, exactly the same rule applies. There appear to be women engaging in the same behavior and girl children engaging in the same behavior, but the reasons for which they're doing it are completely, completely different. Uh, there are lesbians who engage in transgenderism, uh, but for, to ex understand why, we need to understand the oppression of lesbians, why they might wish to e exit that oppressed status. And also for women, if we think about what women gain and what men gain from this practice, women can gain raised status. They actually gain more money too. I mean, in women in a workplace, once they have transgendered, we'll find that they earn more. For men, interestingly, it is the opposite. The men actually will earn less because that's the situation. That's how pay and the workplace are actually organized. So for women, it can be a raise in status. For the men, it's precisely a lowering of status. And that's why it's sexually exciting. Right? Because it's about masochism, they're lowered in status by pretending to be women and little girls and, or disabled women, which gives them a double excitement of lowered statement. I mean, very exciting would be to be a disabled maid, female, you know, a man's got three excitements. Oh, and if you know, a child, uh, you know, add, it's all about the degrees of subordination and humiliation that the men experience that make it exciting for them. There is no comparison for women. And of course, the girls who are being transgendered at the moment, you, unfortunately, we've got what's going on is um, there is a social contagion. Uh, the internet is full of it. And because of the campaigning of the transgender activists, uh, the ideas are being pushed on children that they might want to change their sex in school, um, on the internet, by children's charities, pretty much anywhere you look. Children are being indoctrinated in the idea that they could change sex if they have any anxiety about um, simply who they are, which many, many, many girl children do at 11, 12, 13, 14 years of age. They're extremely anxious about who they are. Some of them are autistic. There's a higher percentage of little girls who are autistic who are moving towards this behavior. There's peer pressure. There's all kinds of reasons why this terribly disturbing stage of a girl's life adolescence where she realizes her subordination 
Uh, she realizes she can't really climb trees anymore because, you know, men will definitely look up her skirt and she's supposed to start revealing her body and wearing ghastly sort of almost nothing on the beach, sexualizing herself. It's a terrible, terrible time in a woman's life when she has to accept that subordination and that her role is to be exciting for men. At that moment, uh, of extreme confusion, girls are being fed this idea, and you can see why someone think, oh, yeah, being a boy is better than that. It would make them, me a little bit safer too. You know, I might be able to walk down the street and be on the tube train and nobody's actually harassing me. Imagine the freedom of that. So you can see what would be attractive to little girls at a very, very dangerous and, and worrying time, the moment at which the oppression hits, the, when they get it and they know what their place is, okay? So many are rejecting this place for all of those kinds of reasons. For none of them is it the excitement of wearing men's underpants? Not for a single one. So the reasons women are drawn in, the women are used as a sort of smoke screen. The transvestites, the men who sexualize women's subordination are able to say, look, women do it too, women do it too. And that's why they wanted to set to transgender the children so that they could pretend this was some innate thing in children. So they campaigned and campaigned and campaigned to make transgendering of children socially acceptable in a way that it is now, not for long. Yeah. It's really changing now. Within a few years, the suing will happen and it's all gonna fall down. But yes, this is what the, the male transvestite activists have created, this transgendering of children. So the women and girls are a kind of smokescreen for what the men want, and it's the men who have pushed to be able to get their erections, to have their ejaculations in the women's toilets. I mean, there's lots of stuff on the internet of men masturbating in women's toilets with extreme glee and so on. So for them, it's just this wonderful, you know, if they are creating this uh, um, brothel in which they can just masturbate everywhere in supposed French maids costumes or whatever, or pornified uniform or, or whatever it is that they want to do. So that's something really different like a strategic cover, the involvement of, of women and children um, to obscure the actual uh, underlying sexual aspect of it. Um, you had mentioned before and said a little bit about it, about the practice of drag um, and how you compare um, drag as woman face as the parallel to black face. Um, and I find that comparison to be really obvious and strong, but whenever I try to um, make that line of argument, I get a lot of pushback um, and there's a real unwillingness to accept that uh, parallel um, or even to, to see it. And uh, I just wonder if you wanted to say more about that, about why it's so, <laughs> so challenging to make what should be a really easy argument there. Yes, I think that the main reason is that racism is seen as something really serious. It's seen as really serious because men are affected by racism. Right? So it's really, really serious. So if you try to make a comparison with a practice which is significantly racist and important in anti-racist politics to be seen that way, you can be seen as racist in yourself. You're suggesting that something that is done to women could be as important as this, could be even like this very, very serious harm that is done to men. Right? And therefore you're racist to suggest that. So I think that unfortunately, that's the underlying thing. And I think there are some women who will say that as well because they can't accept that it could be something important. Women could be important. The mocking of women could be important because it's fundamental to the culture, the mocking of women. How could we say that that should not happen? And therefore they cannot see it as oppressive in the way that an obviously racist practice is. But I think that's the problem that we have. But once people start looking at it carefully and looking at what goes on, uh, the ways in which the behavior is mocked, for instance, you know, when in drag camp language is used, men use little sissy voices, you know, in the same way as in uh, blackface, there will be a, a adopted accents and so on. And the way that the clothing and, and the, the behavior and the body language and so on is adopted. When all of these things are compared, then I think people do start to see, actually, there's a lot of comparison there. And what I do in the book and, and at more length in other places 
is to look at what are the harms of black, blackface that are recognized, you know, the degradation of status, the effect on the way that young, young black people are able to think about themselves um, and the, the, the cultural effects of the practice. Once you start comparing that across, then of course, it, it, woman face can come into focus. I mean, for instance, in, in my town, there's a gay pride parade and um, you know, a very big one in, in the UK. And uh, a couple of months ago when there was gay pride, there were young women, probably teenagers, dressed up as drag queens in the street. Because drag queen has now become a normalized, uh, but not just normalized, but a glorified cultural form of how women should look. I mean, that's an extraordinary situation. But the the absolute cultural dominance now of drag, and it really has become so, affects the way that women can see themselves and is affecting the way women should be representing themselves, what they should be doing to their hair and their feet, uh, and so on and so on. So drag affects culture. Also, the hatred of women, this is a crucial part of drag culture, uh, comes out of drag and into the um, ordinary world. For instance, in, in, the, in my chapter or my section on drag, I explain that the, um, the judging rules for RuPaul's Drag Race creates the acronym C-U-N-T, charisma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they actually use the word C-U-N-T as the basis of the rules. And of course, they constantly refer to women as fish, and fish is a way that, uh, that in gay male um, argo, women are referred to. And it's a, a derogatory way of, relate, of saying that women's genital smell, it's a disgusting smell. Women are like fish. So that's ordinary. So unfortunately, the very serious and vicious hatred of women that exists in drag and that whole part and scene in gay male culture is now becoming absolutely pervasive to the extent that we have little toddlers in public libraries being entertained by drag queens who have bulging penises in underneath their skirts and are doing suggestive gestures because drag is really, it's about strip male sexual entertainment. That's where it comes from and that's what it's about. What's extraordinary is that they've managed to make this an entertainment for toddlers in public libraries. That's how acceptable it is. And I think that refers to your earlier point that if something apparently relates to homosexuality, somehow people are supposed to approve of it. It's about diversity. It's all good. But of course, I always say, how come lesbians are not being invited into public libraries to speak to toddlers? Nobody thought of it. Nobody thought of it. So there is an extraordinary normalization of the sexual practices of gay male, gay male culture, many of which are extremely abusive, being um, actually uh, performed and promoted in front of children. So, so we've reached a very, very sorry pass, unfortunately, in terms of male sexuality in its most pro problematic forms being normalized at this point. Uh, and of course, drag is something which has been extraordinarily normalized. You, you know, drag took place secretly in particular pubs that were known about back in the 60s and 70s. Now it's in the public library. So I think this is a very good example of what's going on. No, it is. And, and women, would you say that women are encouraged to embrace drag uh, sort of in order that we have a sense of humor about, about our oppression and about misogyny to sort of uh, neutralize upset about it? Because I, I feel that that is part of it. Um, I knew so many women who loved RuPaul's Drag Race and I always felt it was just sort of sitting through a painful hour of watching men mock me. <laughs> um, but women seem to really enjoy it or feel that they should find it amusing. Um, and that seems a, a strategic way to neutralize women's potential upset over misogyny. Would you say there's an element? I just, I'm just very disturbed by the way in which women are so unable to recognize misogyny. I mean, this shouldn't be surprising because very many women wear high heeled shoes, for instance and have no idea that it's about the crippling of, the, of them for men's delight. They seem to think this is a part of who they are as women. So women have been trained into all of these horrendous practices, which are very harmful to them and very exciting to men. So when they see these practices ex exaggerated, 
potentially they could see it as actually sort of a compliment yeah? because they might think that these kind of terrible practices are really what a woman is. And if a man wants to do it because men are so much more important than women and women are so lowly, they should be really feel a bit grateful you know, about all of this. But I think it also just shows the extraordinary inability to see misogyny as it is carried out upon their own bodies, apart from anything else in this culture. And it is extremely disturbing. I agree with you about that. Yes, um, thank you. So for my final question, um, I just want to know what your ideas are about how we can incorporate this understanding of the male sex right and the political sway of male sexual entitlement um, into our activism moving forward? I think that we just have to connect everything up. We can't really talk about prostitution and pornography without talking about transgenderism, particularly because there's many big crossovers in that area. Um, and the transgendering of children, for instance, is, is usually done for the purposes of, porno, of prostitution, men using children in prostitution and so on. So we need to, to join up all of these practices so that we understand the total effect. I think separating everything out, as one of the things I explain in the book, as feminists have always said, we're not allowed to make to join up. We're not allowed to see everything together and see all of the connections. And we vitally need to see all of the connections. But that's frightening. And once women are aware of just how far this goes and how much it affects their lives in the bedroom, on the street, in their lipstick, and so on and so on, that can be very disturbing. So I do, at the end of the book, try to say, actually, we can have some successes. It is possible to change some of these things, and we must. And we are. I mean, huge numbers of feminists are working worldwide right now in this new wave, and it is a new wave, a huge wave of feminism and we need to join everything together and we will be at least partly successful. I don't think we're gonna get there in the next 20 years, but you know, there's so much we can do. Yeah, thank you. And I, I really thank you for making the, those connections so apparent um, because we do tend to silo things and go at them as sort of one-off issues when um, when there's a much more integrated phenomenon uh, at work. So I thank you for making that clear in your book. Um, is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you wanted to, to add before I- No, no, that's, that's fine, Aurora. Uh, and what I find really pleasing, I must say, in terms of you wanting this interview, for instance, is that there are young women who like my work. And here I am, um, <laughs> a, a, a grandmother age to all of these, lovely young women who many of whom actually really like my work and that's fantastic to me I mean that my work is still relevant because I'm saying the same things I was saying in the 1970s I really am and now it has this new relevant in young relevance in young women's lives and that's fantastic for me it's a huge satisfaction for me oh good well I've I've loved your books uh from the 70s onward and so I've been really glad too to see uh to see you have a resurgence and to see more people paying attention <laughs> to you. So Thank, thank thanks, you. Aurora. Lovely to talk to you. Lovely to talk to you as well. Have a great rest of your day and enjoy your lovely, polite cat. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Will do. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that extended interview between WLRN member Aurora Linnea and Sheila Jeffries. WLRN is a group of media activist women who come together to bring you news, interviews, music shows, and other specials highlighting the importance of women's spaces and places. We are always looking for women to keep us moving forward. If you are interested in joining some super, totally excellent radical feminists, then please send along a letter of interest to info at womensliberationradionews.com. I look forward to hearing from you, sister. Let's link arms and fight male supremacy together. Until next time, this is WLRN Canadian member April No, hoping you all stay, stay radical. radical.